Well, I don't know about you, but I, I, love, I love stories. Uh, I guess we all do, don't we? We love stories from childhood. I, I looked forward to bedtime and hearing those familiar phrases, once upon a time, especially when the story ended with the words, and so they lived happily ever after. Well, now a grandfather, I find myself opening a book and saying, once upon a time, as a little two and a half year old clambers into my lap, uh, holding good night Mr. Moon, or Spot Loves Bedtime, or my current favorite, the story of Jim, who ran away from his nurse and was eaten by a lion. Uh, Carrie isn't sure about that one, but I love it. <laughs> of course, the story doesn't end happily. Not every story does, does it? We learn that as we grow up. Now in adulthood, don't we love a happy ending? In a world such as ours of, of such pain and sadness, I picked up the, the Sunday newspaper today and, and scanned the headlines. The week's headlines are full of tragic stories. Uh, those teenagers who cold-bloodedly killed a mother and daughter, now sentenced to 20 years in prison at least. The report of the 40 bodies left hanging on poles by ISIS as they retreated from Mosul in Iraq. The, the tsunami which hit Christchurch, New Zealand after an earthquake just a few hours ago. And then Leonard Cohen's death. Have you been across that one? Leonard Cohen, the hugely influential songwriter and poet. I encourage uh, all of us to get to grips with some of Leonard Cohen's uh, lyrics. He had a few column inches in the news coverage uh, today. In many ways, uh, Cohen's music reflected the soundtrack, the sad soundtrack of humanity. Like a bird on a wire, like a drunk in a midnight choir, I have tried in my way to be free. Always honest, Cohen, always haunting, ultimately always hopeless actually. I, I thought of a song from the 1990s uh, this week, because I was absorbing, like the rest of you, no doubt, the media reaction to the results of the US presidential election. Everyone trying to make sense of, of where we are now in an uncertain world. Uh, the, the song from the 90s that triggered for me was, was made popular by Anne Murray. Do you know it? I rolled out this morning. Kids had the morning news show on. Bryant Gumbel was talking about the fighting in Lebanon. Some senator was squawking about the bad economy. It's going to get worse, you see. We need a change in policy. There's a local paper rolled up in a rubber band. One more sad stories, one more than I can stand. Just once. How I'd like to see the headlines say, not much to print today, can't find the heart of the Old Testament. We have another in our series, uh, Dare to Believe, the prophet and the leper. Once upon a time, there was a man called Naaman. It's a good news story, you see, in a bad news world. I think that's a good definition of, of the whole Bible. For there is one theme that runs right through Scripture, the story of the relationship between God, the Creator, and humanity, how it began, uh, how it was spoiled, how it can be cured, and how one day it'll be perfectly restored. The Bible storyline explains the human condition, who we are, and where we are, and why we are. Can I quote Leonard? Cohen, who obviously you appreciate, I, I'm across quite a lot. Let me quote Leonard Cohen just one last time. It's a famous line in his song, Anthem. 
Everyone was tweeting and posting it on social media last, last Friday. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. That's the once upon a time true story which the Bible tells of the world. Here's where we are. Here's who we are. There's a crack in everything. It's broken. It's messed up. It's spoiled. But light has got through. There's good news, you see, in a bad news world. And the one word which best sums up the good news is the word salvation. And this word is wonderfully illustrated for us in the story from 2 Kings chapter 5. So let's, let's have a look at our Bibles now. Once upon a time, there was a Syrian army commander called Naaman. Firstly, think with me about his situation, his, his, his context. We all live, don't we, in a given context. We have a framework of reference. Our story locates us somewhere. Naaman's situation was that, firstly, he lived in a great location. I don't know where uh, or what you would regard as the most desirable place on earth. Chengdu? Charminster? Clacton-on-Sea? Well, in the ancient world, Naaman lived in a dream destination. Damascus, the beautiful capital city of Aram, modern-day Syria. It's almost impossible to believe that now, isn't it? Syria has been turned into a graveyard. It's war-torn, it's tragic. But back then, Damascus in Syria was a place where you'd want to go for a vacation. Two fine rivers fed the pleasant tree-lined streets and the marketplaces. Crystal clear rivers which began in the mountains of Lebanon and flowed down to the fertile oasis of trees below. It was there in the lowland that Damascus was built, a center for art and culture and music. It was a great place to live, a great place to hang out. That's where Naaman lived. Secondly, Naaman enjoyed an enviable position. He had, as the text says, he had lots of power. He was a five-star general, a commander in the Syrian army. He was a great man, says verse 1, highly regarded by the king. He had all the prestige and all the authority which went with such a position. When he said jump, everyone did. He had fantastic wealth. You get some idea of just how wealthy Naaman was when we see him traveling to meet Elisha the prophet in verse 5 with all the gold and silver and shackles and clothing. He had made it. He was in an enviable position from every angle. He had power and prestige and position, possessions. He went to all the right parties. He knew all the right people. His lifestyle was always being uh, featured in Hello magazine or Army Illustrated or high society chariots. But when we've said all that about Naaman's situation, how amazing it was, how desirable it was, we haven't mentioned the one thing, the most important thing about him. He was great, he was highly regarded, He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. All of his wealth, all of his influence, all of his achievements were overshadowed by this one thing which ruined his otherwise perfect life. He was a leper. When people thought about Commander Naaman, they knew that he was a great, powerful figure, but above all, they said, Naaman has leprosy. So from his situation, let's think secondly about his affliction. His affliction. Of course, in our modern world, leprosy is a very specific medical condition. But in the ancient world, leprosy was the word used to cover, in fact, a a, a number, a variety of skin conditions. Whatever form Naaman's leprosy took, it would have made this great man's life a complete misery. 
All that he enjoyed, all the benefits of his possessions could not come close to tackling his problem, and it was spoiling his life. And this is where the the once upon a time story begins to get relevant to us. You see, up to now, we, we could be thinking, oh, well, yeah, it's an interesting historical reflection on a Syrian army general from the ninth century before Christ. All very fascinating, all well and good, but what's it got to do with me, with us? Where's the connection point to my world and my life? Naaman's affliction was a spoiling, spreading, ugly, separating uh, affliction. And that is a classic biblical image or picture of the condition of men and women this evening everywhere in the world, in the UK, in Bournemouth. It's the condition that the Bible calls sin. It's the thing which separates us from God, our creator, and others. It's the thing which spoils our world. It's the thing which ruins our happiness. That's the point of contact with this once upon a time story, you see. Because the physical condition that Naaman faced is a picture of the spiritual condition faced by each one of us. Here is the explanation for the sad music of humanity, for the lives broken by loneliness and isolation by fear and guilt. That's the point of contact with us. Something is now sadly true of humanity, which, like leprosy, disfigures and ruins and spreads. Uh, Stephen caught it well in his little talk He referred to the cycle of sin, which he could not break. You see, folks, we can't understand our context, our situation. We can't make sense of the lyrics of a Leonard Cohen or a David Bowie without seeing that in addition to our enviable position and our desirable location, we are fallen, broken, and ruined by sin. What is it Mark Twain once wrote? Man is the only animal that blushes and the only one that needs to. Again, quoting Stephen, who was quoting Paul, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Oh, leprosy didn't care about uh, name and status. And we, likewise, can can reel off our CV, which may not be as grand as the commanders here, but we can point to this or that or the other. I've done this, I've got that, I'm here, I'm there. Yet we have to finish. We all do with the, but we are out of step with God, out of step with ourselves, out of step with everyone else, but... We have spiritual leprosy. We are sinners. It is this which finds uh, so many people today living with great regret, wondering why it is that we can't wash out the spots and stains of our past, living with a sense of guilt and fear, living with a deep-seated resentment and anger, living with a sense of emptiness and aloneness and disappointment. And no matter where we go and what we do, there's this sad music that, that keeps playing in the back of our heads and spoils everything. No matter how much we've got, how successful we are, how gifted and sorted the music plays, the sadness of our soul. There wasn't a a chariot that Naaman could ride in. There wasn't an outfit that he could wear that could hide or cure his affliction. And folks, there's not a car that you or I can buy and drive. There's not a stylist that you can employ. There's not a makeover that you can have that will take care of the sin that spoils and spreads and separates and detracts from our happiness and makes us so unhappy. No matter how much we've got, no matter where we live, 
He doesn't buy the peace of mind that we're searching for. Enough is never enough for us. Possessions are, are never enough. Beauty is never beautiful enough. Relationships are never romantic enough. Enough is never enough. And our lives are full of jealousy, often, and envy, and bitterness. Without exception, you see, we are suffering from the leprosy of our souls. And there is nothing, nothing, no success, no achievement, no wealth that can ever cure it. That's Naaman's condition, and it's ours. That's the connection point. Now, lastly, his solution. Naaman's solution, Naaman's cure. Obviously, Naaman has the, the resources to get any kind of cure he wants. Access to the best doctors, the latest treatments. He, he could go to any lengths to effect a cure, but he is helpless in spite of all that to do anything. There is, you see, an inability in humanity to fix the problem. We can't change the music. So Parliament pronounces this latest legislation. The scientists come up with the latest invention. The environmentalists with a new suggestion. Oh, we'll regain our, our border controls. But that doesn't stop the sad music. Oh, we still can't fix the problem. War continues. Syria is dying before our eyes. The most powerful and affluent country in the world is in shock this week. The Washington establishment, completely out of touch with the majority who want to make America great again. So who's going to fix it? Who's going to fix the gun crime and the race relations issues? Donald Trump. He's the great white hope. No, no doubt, Naaman was looking for a grand solution, something that was consistent with his status, something that would play to his self-esteem, his ego. But notice the solution comes from an unexpected source. Bands of Aram, verse 2, had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. We don't know the girl's name. She's anonymous. We don't know how old she was. All we know is that she was a victim of war, a displaced person, a cleaning lady, a servant who spent all her day sweeping up. But growing up, she had been told stories by her parents of the living God and the prophet of God who had healing powers. And she remembered those stories and she repeated them. And so eventually, Mrs. Naaman gets round to telling her husband about the gossip from the servants' quarters and about a holy man in Israel who could cure his leprosy. At which point in the story, Nathan, uh, Naaman takes charge. If he has to go to this God and his prophet, then it will be on his terms. So he gets his best chariots out of the stables and horses, and he packs up all his wealth, thousands and thousands of pounds worth of it. There is not a solution he knows which, which money can't buy. And he sends a letter via his master, the king of Aram, to the king of Israel. And eventually, he turns up to a, uh, with a great fanfare outside the, Elisha the prophet's house. You see, he has dealt with every, every other situation in his life in precisely that way. He's in charge. It's his wealth. He will demonstrate that. He will buy a solution. So why not this one? Yet, in the story, did you read it? Elisha, the prophet, won't even come out to meet him. Ah, he sends his little errand boy, and that enrages Nahum. What? Can't you see the limousines out here? Do you know who you're dealing with, man? 
I would at least have thought that you could have come out of your house and waved your hand over me and healed me. Hey, look at all my money. This has got to buy me the best magic in town. So many people think of God and faith like that. I may need God, but I will have him on my own terms. So many people think that's the way you deal with a problem of sin. You go find a religious man, and you park your car, your plush car, outside his little house or his church, and you put money into his offering bucket, and you ask him to come out and wave his hand over the spot and and fix you up. If I need God, it'll be on my terms. Friend, it'll never happen. It'll never happen. No one has ever been cured of spiritual leprosy as a result of a religious ceremony performed by a religious person. So what are God's terms? Did you hear them in the text? Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be cleansed. But Naaman's terms are the great, important rivers of Syria. Not this little backwater which flows in that strip of land which they raided and conquered several times, the Syrians. What? The Jordan? That pokey little river? Isn't this the story of the gospel? You see, the solution, the cure for the world, comes from an unexpected source. Follow the line of the argument. Here, here's the great Syrian empire, one of the power blocks of the, of the ancient world. And then there's little Israel, that little strip of land in the Middle East. Israel, what can come out of that insignificant place, eh? And the answer is that what came out of Judah became the solution to the condition of Naaman. This is the good news story, folks. And it surprises us at every stage. For the solution to my need takes me ultimately there, to that out-of-the-way place, that provincial little town called Bethlehem, Judah, to a cradle to a baby. And we keep sounding surprised at God's terms as the baby becomes a man. And people say, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can this, him, he be the Messiah? And then when he goes up to Jerusalem, we expect that he will arrive in power on a charger or something, not on a donkey. And we expect him to sort everyone out in Jerusalem and to take his place on a throne of power. Instead, he goes to a cross. Like Naaman, we say, no, there are better places that I can go. There are better solutions that I can find. Solutions which leave my ego intact. There'll be none of this kneeling down in the dirty waters of the Jordan River. Not only did the solution come from an unexpected source, the cure itself was a very unusual remedy. Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan. Oh, he didn't like that. God's terms hurt his pride and humbled him. But these are God's terms. This river and none other, you don't get to pick and choose the one that you want to dip in. How does the Apostle Paul put it in his letter to the Corinthian church? We preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. You see, there is no other river 
There is no other way. There is no other cure, no other solution. This is the good news. But we don't like it. Because the bad news is, we don't get to decide the terms of our own acceptance. We are not in charge of the cure. After all, what did Naaman bring to the Jordan? His condition, his leprosy. Oh, he brought gold and silver and fine wardrobes. Yeah, but what good was all that? No good at all. Are you telling me, preacher, are you telling me that my morality, my possessions in life, my giving to charity is not in the equation, is not enough? That's exactly what I'm telling you. Exactly. Only when we come like Naaman to understand that we have nothing to contribute to our solution but our sin from which we need to be saved. Only when we are prepared to admit that our sole defense is Jesus upon that cross taking my condition, my pain, my guilt, my mess in his own body that I might be cured. Do you know it nearly didn't happen for Naaman in the story? He was so angry at God's terms. Hey, Naaman, Naaman, his servants tell him in verse 13, if the prophet had told you to do something grand, a big gesture, you would have done it, wouldn't you? If he'd come out and said, well, I want a million in gold and your entire wardrobe, you would have said, go back and get the stuff. If I told you this evening, oh, here's the way into the kingdom of heaven, give X amount to the church, or go on this pilgrimage, run around three times the block, and when you come back, I'll give you a a, a little lapel badge, that'll be your security. There'll be plenty of takers for that. We find that attractive because, because it leaves us with our ego. We can do it. We can give. We can perform. We can run. I did this. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Here's the deal. Get down on your knees and admit that your possessions, your privileges have nothing to do with it. Uh, Admit that your desirable location, your enviable position cannot wash away that spiritual leprosy. Bend down and wash in the river of God's forgiveness. Oh, we don't need to do it seven times. Once is enough. Bend down and believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he bore your sin. That's the cure. That is the good news story. In a bad news world, do you believe it? Let's pray. Father, thank you for Stephen's story, the story of rescue and salvation. Keep Stephen, we pray, by your grace. May, uh, as he grows up into maturity and a job and a career and whatever you have for him, may he be a man of God. May he walk with you. May he talk of you. May his life be shaped by the good news that he's come to embrace personally. Thank you for the story of Stephen. Thank you for the story of Naaman, the man who had to be humbled, to bend down, to accept your terms for his cure. Thank you for the story of the Lord Jesus, the one who was born in obscurity and poverty, who who had nothing this world claims as desirable. Thank you that the Lord Jesus died in our place on the cross and rose again to cure us of the sad music in our soul. 
So may each of us personally, in the storyline of our lives, come to the water of forgiveness that you offer us in Jesus. May we stoop down and drink and live. For Jesus' sake, amen.